There we go. All right. Uh, welcome everyone to uh, last even later session of the Teaching for Learning conference. Uh, my name is Gretchen Blackburn. Blackburn. I'm an instructional designer at Utah State University, um, and I'll be moderating today. We're really excited to hear from Oscar Rodriguez from Southern Utah University, um, and I'll turn it over to him to introduce himself and give you his presentation. Thank you, Gretchen, and thank you everybody that has joined us. I see uh, Galen, I see Joshua, I see Ammon, Scott, Jennifer, uh, who else is with us? Rebecca, uh, Mason, Daniel, thank you so much for joining us. Hopefully we got something good for uh, the closing of our long uh, day session today. Um, again, my name is Oscar Rodriguez and I'm at uh, SEU uh, in the Department of Engineering and Technology. And today I'd like to share one of our latest experiences uh, regarding using remote laboratories um, to deliver some of the hands-on applications for a variety of students, including engineering, computer, and technology students. Um, so let's go ahead and move with that. I have a probably two and a half, three minutes uh, video uh, just in case uh, you uh, end up with uh, the curiosity of what it was that we actually used. I got data to share a little bit of a survey, but uh, I have a two, three minutes video to just give you an idea of the actual application of this remote lab. So let me play that for you and hopefully you will be able to hear me. Um, All right, I wanted to get, just um, create a short video, two, three minutes video, um, to give you an idea of the uh, FPGI remote lab that we use for uh, supporting some of the engineering and technology and computer science um, classes and students. All right, I wanted to get, just, um, create a short video, two, three minutes video, um, to give you an idea of the uh, FPGI remote lab that we use. Uh, are you guys able to hear the video at all? Uh, we're able to hear Oscar, but uh, we're not able to see it. Um, okay. It's just an audio. Okay, no, it is a video. So let me go back. I'm sorry about that. I'm gonna change, switch over for some reason it's not deploying. I think you need to share your screen again. Yes. Okay, perfect. Okay. And so, All right, I wanted to get, just um, create a short video, two, three minutes video, um, to give you an idea of the uh, FPGI remote lab that we use for uh, supporting some of the engineering and technology and computer science um, classes and students. So here I am, I have one sample program in here which is a LED mirror. Basically, we're gonna be able to control LEDs with switches and seven segment displays and second part with push buttons. So let's go ahead and compile our program. Once we compile, So it doesn't look like my screen is coming out, is it? I'm so sorry. I, I just tested this um, before we got here. So let me do one more time. Oh, we could see the video. We were could you see to. it? Yeah, we were able to. Okay. I'm so sorry. Yeah, I, myself. No I'm, okay. All right. Um, so. Then we can upload to the board. Hopefully the board is going to be available for us. So it's going through the compilation process. I'm going to briefly stop it while this compiler and take a couple of minutes. And uh, Oscar, when you muted yourself, we can't hear the video anymore. <laughs> and we're going to be taken to some place in the planet, uh, Europe, Central South America, to access the FPGA board. And so directing me this time, we're going to the University of Republic de Navarra, that's in Spain. Um, 
we have a nice altera warhead that we can run. So let's go ahead and start the switches to enable the LEDs. That's one switch. That's binary three, binary seven, binary 15, binary 31, and so forth. And whatever combination with the key uh, switches, fish button, we actually can enable the seven second display. That is zero. That is one. Right? That will be two. And that will be three. And we have tested our Braille code using a remote lab, in this case, an Altera FPGA laboratory board um, at uh, the Public University of Navarra in Spain. So that's a short demo on this particular application. Students made a number of labs uh, and concluded, tested them out, and uh, were successful at using this. So this is one type of remote lab that we have. So I'm going to leave here and end the video here for you. Okay. That was just a short barrel of ID FPGA board demo, which is part of the remote lab that we adopted. This best here. Thank you. All right, I'll do a little change here um, with the uh, full screen. Are you seeing the full screen now to continue on? Not yet. Okay. Okay. All right, I wanted to be just. Um, okay. There we go, you can see it now. Okay. Yeah, good. So that's our, uh, uh, the points that I'd like to cover with you at this moment, um, briefly uh, discuss the background, uh, an idea on the needs analysis for the remote lab, the specification of lab uh, equipment requirements, the actual implementation, which you saw some of that already. And then I'll show you some of the data that I got out of the a pilot study that I uh, launched uh, right after the implementation of this lab. Okay. All right, so everybody talks about the need to provide more opportunities uh, for uh, students in the engineering and technical field to get some hands-on experience. And uh, that's even more critical today as we have um, uh, what we have before us, and that's the challenges of students. Um, um, Oscar, are you trying to show some slides right now? Oh, there we go. Now they're up. And so the, the challenge that we have uh, with access to physical equipment uh, can be mitigated um, using similar uh, remote equipment to the one that I, that I just showed you here. Uh, and so a couple of definitions for what we have, uh, remote labs, uh, it's a way to provide interaction uh, to users uh, over the distance as if they were using the equipment in, in a, a physical location where they can touch it. Uh, one example of these remote labs is the um, Labsland, which is the company we're using to use those laboratories. Uh, and this company connects universities with laboratory equipment uh, that is available anywhere in the planet, really. And these are real laboratories um, that have uh, Arduino power robots um, that can be, they can be in Spain, kinematics laboratories that can, they can be in Brazil, uh, radioactivity testing lab that could be something in Australia. And these are actually real labs and not simulations um, that are physically there and that students can actually access them at any time. Uh, when it comes to looking at uh, an analysis of the remote laboratory equipment, uh, we ask the question, what is involved um, for engineering and technical students in this? And basically, you need some space, furniture, equipment, computers, servers, connectivity, and, and such. Um, as far as specifying, then we look at the disciplines that we offer. Um, what are the requirements for the specific disciplines that we offer? And so whether you're doing mechanical or mechatronics, 
electrical computers, you have to look at the, the remote uh, equipment uh, needs. Uh, and that could be robots, controls, uh, embedded systems, FPGAs, like the one that I show you, and any other similar equipment. So um, the options that we have when we look at possibly uh, implementing remote labs is uh, self-hosting those labs, which means we will be responsible for everything. Uh, the other option is the third party uh, leasing or renting like we are doing now, or the other possibility is to partner up with some other institution that have similar kinds of similar kinds of interests, um, and you could partner with them to be able to deploy those labs. Um, so uh, going down to the actual study uh, after the fact, um, I had uh, a few questions, uh, included an open-ended question that I uh, asked uh, my students this past year uh, regarding the use of this uh, remote labs. What was the uh, best, what was the worst, and what things could be improved? Uh, and then some really uh, key questions uh, because I wanted to check the relevance um, of, of the lab implementation, uh, whether they learn uh, how difficult or easy it was to use this equipment, and ultimately whether it was effective to accomplish the educational objectives, and also the hours of operation. In our case, actually, the labs were available uh, all the time, uh, only that I couldn't you know, provide support all the time. But anyways, questions regarding these, um, these items uh, were um, asked on the survey. And I'm gonna share with you the results of two sets of data, two different groups of students. And there's a little bit of contrast in results based on what I got here. So this is one section of students um, of uh, only 12 students. And uh, you can see that the background was a mix of first year, second year, uh, and third year students um, with a composition of 80 plus percent uh, from computer science and information and about 17 percent from engineering and technology all right that was the that was the background and major study of the students um, the two questions that i asked about the uh, reactions that they had uh, and whether they learned or not uh, you can see here that um, there were a lot of mixed reactions about 58 percent reacted positively while 17% were undecided and eight disagree. Uh, in other words, they reacted negatively, negatively, and then 17% um, that strongly disagree with uh, the reaction to the use of the system. Uh, as far as learning, uh, about 58%, uh, almost similar numbers. You can see that that was the uh, response of students, whether they learn or not. So 58% didn't think or said that they learn. Uh, whereas the rest of them were undecided or in total disagreement. Um, as far as the relevance and the ease of use of the lab equipment, about 75% um, said that was relevant, eight undecided, 17 actually disagree. And um, ease of use, um, about 67%, though that, that was pretty e easy to use whereas 34% disagree that was easy to use. Again, this is the first set of data about the appropriateness and effectiveness of the lab. I had about 75% responded that was appropriate, 8% decided 17% in this agreement. 67% um, uh, saying that was effective, eight undecided 17 in this agreement, and eight is strongly disagreeing, okay? Um, and so that was one section one group, um, this is actually a summary, this slide you're looking at of uh, students, um, a little bit of a different composition and that's actually a different group, a different section. Um, you should observe here that the majority of the students are computer science students and the majority or a large group of them were third year, four year students. And so you're gonna see a difference also in terms of the data collected. Uh, notice the reaction went up to what, 92%. Uh, uh, reacting positively to, to the use of the remote lab. As far as learning, 86% uh, versus 14%. As far as relevance, about uh, 80, 93%. Um, ease of use, uh, we're looking at 87, 86% uh, saying that was easy, easy to use. As far as appropriateness, 
um, we got 93% versus 7%, considering uh, the use of the remote lab appropriate. And 86% of them uh, said that was effective. And so we got a mix of data. It is what it is uh, for a first year experience. I um, attribute this results to one, the student uh, areas of study. The second group was actually pretty heavily, um, uh, mainly computer science and technology students uh, versus the previous group was a larger student uh, group, also the second cohort. Uh, and honestly, as I think about this data, uh, some of my concluding thoughts was like, uh, you know, uh, the oldest child in the family always suffers the consequences of an untrained parent, right? Versus the younger child that gets a little bit spoiled or better trained. And that is to say, um, since this was a new system for me, I learned as I went with the first group and then I made some improvements as I supported the second group. So I attribute some of the results um, to that situation. Um, that About could have five happened. minutes, Oscar. Thank you, thank you, in, in actuality. And so um, that's the uh, results of the implementation of this remote lab. I'd like to finally uh, share with you a few resources. You're gonna have this available uh, that I found useful uh, when I started investigating about uh, the options for remote labs. The first one is uh, University of Central Florida, a lot of uh, free resources for online remote teaching. Uh, Fire Labs is another one. And then of course, the one that we use, which is a very low cost or semester-based, annual or semester-based subscription. All right. Um, my apologies for all the little hurdles in here. Hopefully we got the main meat of our conversation, our presentation, and we got about two or three uh, minutes. Gretchen, maybe to for, respond to any questions that the audience might have. Uh, yeah, you're welcome to. Okay, yeah. So anyhow, that's, uh, that's my sharing. It's uh, still a work in progress. Comment or questions? Uh, in the chat, Scott asked, how did you like using the remote lab? I personally like it. And uh, not only that, um, I can see the benefit um, with what we're having. I have, I'm sure you do have a mix of audiences to cater your education to. I had students that wanted to see me in the lab. I had students on the campus that didn't want to see me. I had students that could not, were not able to be here in the city. And so uh, a lot of those students benefited from this. And I think in the absence of physical equipment they cannot have with them, this remote lab actually met a need. And so it, we learn as we go. Um, I liked it, um, it worked for me. And hopefully on the second round, the second year, as we continue to use it as a good tool, um, it's gonna be a good thing. There's a lot of emerging um, thought in this idea of using remote labs. So I think we'll see more and more remote lab equipment being used for engineering and technology uh, programs. Thank you for asking. Great. And then a couple more questions. Daniel asked, what other fields have remote labs? I'm in biology. Okay, yeah. And I think um, biology, uh, this particular company has, um, I think a set of equipment to do some uh, biology testing. Um, so I would explore LabsLine as an option. Uh, they actually have a free account for instructors and uh, that'll be my recommendation. Uh, there's a lot of merging, merging uh, applications uh, for almost all fields, especially in traditional areas where um, it's hard to do the hands-on part. Good. Great. And then uh, Joshua Holt asked, what options are there for assessment using the remote labs? How do stu students demonstrate their learning to you? Yeah, that, that's excellent. So um, one way is um, we had labs along the way. I think I completed about 12 labs for a semester and that was, um, programming in Verilo, which is one of the programming languages for FPGA, and then delivering those labs um, both as reports uh, and also as actual implementations using this remote FPGA um, laboratory equipment. And I'll say the majority of the students um, did well as they implemented their uh, experiments and uh, uh, projects. Great. Um, got a little under a minute, so if there's any other questions, feel free to drop them in the chat or um, uh, feel free to unmute yourself as well. Yeah, um, once again, I, I appreciate your tolerance in all the hurdles that I had with the multiple screens, but uh, hopefully we got the meat of the 
the presentation. <laughs> Looks good. I'm not seeing any other questions. So thank you so much, Oscar. It was a pleasure to have you. Thank you. And thank you to all who attended. Thank you, everybody.